and welcome again. This is Bruce Erickson with Purdue University Agronomy. And here we are another week uh, into the uh, webinar series here where we talk about uh, the technology, the future, the applications, everything related to using data in agriculture, which uh, holds great promise, not only in crops, but in livestock, in uh, forestry applications, and food processing and all types of things related to uh, agriculture. And so um, just uh, we wanted to point out uh, that uh, actually later this afternoon, there is a, another webinar uh, following this one that uh, may be of interest to you. And uh, we'll put the link in the, in the chat there so you can actually click on that. But uh, the, the title of this is Smart Sensors for Controlled Environment uh, Agriculture. So if you're on this webinar, uh, we, we presume that you might be interested in this one also. Okay, so uh, next slide. Thank you. You're anticipating my every need, Randy. So uh, a word from our sponsors here, uh, as the title says, uh, our website uh, where you can find uh, past recordings uh, of previous webinars. Check out that UAV site uh, from our one of our previous uh, webinar um, presenters. And also, uh, please know that uh, we appreciate the support of the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network with their website there. So um, part of the reason that we do this. Coming up in future webinars are um, next week, Dr. Widmar, Public Data for the Public Good, and then Dr. Evans, a week after that, Machines and uh, Robotics. So um, if you've attended one of these, you sort of, you know the drill. Um, use the chat room uh, to ask your questions during the presentation, but uh, at the end we do an open mic type of thing. So if you'd rather ask it verbally, wait to the end uh, or type it and we'll do one of the two. And uh, please leave your cameras off and your microphone muted uh, during the presentations and we'll all get along just a little bit better. So um, at this time, it's my pleasure to um, introduce a topic um, that uh, should be of great interest to uh, a number of the people that are on this webinar today, and that's about IoT networks and talking about the uh, sensors and the data vis visualization. And uh, we're going to, to um, uh, introduce here, they're going to, I'm going to let them introduce themselves actually. Nithin and Harris are both um, on the line, and uh, if you can take over the slides. Again, um, we appreciate uh, you joining us and we'll be interested in what you have to say. So anyway, Harris, you're taking the first segment. So um, thanks, thanks again. Uh, thank you, uh, can you hear me? Yep. And uh, you can see my uh, screen sharing, right? So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harris and uh, with Nithin, uh, we're going to present uh, the work of the uh, Purdue Win IoT infrastructure and data analytics team. We're going to talk about the IoT networks and the sensors and the data visualization. And uh, the outline of uh, the webinar, we're going to start with an overview uh, on the uh, Purdue IoT group and the Win project. Uh, we're going to move on with the uh, Purdue R&D on the Ag IoT network structure and deployments. And uh, and I'm handing it over to Nathan, who's going to talk about the manufacturing deployments and sensor networks. And uh, we're going to share some challenges that uh, uh, we're facing. And uh, uh, we're going to end with the Q&A. So uh, my name is Harris. I'm a senior research scientist of the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Purdue University. Uh, I have been working on the uh, WIN project for the last uh, four years, if I remember correctly, and uh, I'm uh, helping the coordination and uh, uh, providing help on uh, uh, many aspects of the IoT infrastructure and data analytics team. And I'm uh, working very closely with Nithin, who apart from a colleague, he's a very dear friend. And uh, Nithin is a research scientist at uh, the Bergnau Technology Center here at Purdue University. And our uh, roles and goals are very similar for this project. So in these slides, I'm going to talk uh, with Nathan on the work of our team, the IoT Infrastructure Data Analytics. 
and we're going to cover uh, work from the manufacturing groups uh, on desperate and research. You can see uh, uh, the folks that are working on uh, these uh, groups and uh, uh, we're collaborating uh, very closely with the manufacturing group but with uh, the rest of the groups as well that are working on the uh, WIN project. So um, the WIN project is uh, um, for uh, the uh, Wabas Heartland location in Indiana. It covers 10 counties uh, around uh, Tippecanoe County, Purdue University. And uh, it's a five-year uh, grant from the Lean Endowment that started in 2017, was four years ago. And the goal of this project is to make these uh, uh, um, 10 counties uh, the epicenter for uh, precision ag agriculture and uh, smart manufacturing, empower the businesses to plant and grow in the Wabas heartland. So uh, there is uh, uh, many folks at Purdue that are working in this project. Uh, I think there are around 100 people working on this from uh, different disciplines, including agriculture, manufacturing, the IoT team here at Bergner Technology Center, and are at the Center for uh, the Regional Development and uh, Administration. So I'm going, going to dive into uh, the uh, uh, details of our agriculture networks and IoT deployments. And uh, then I'm going to hand it over to Nathan, who's going to talk about the manufacturing side. Uh, so the uh, first slide here uh, shows the overview structure of our agriculture IoT uh, networks. We start with a node on the left that uh, uh, through the LoRa communication protocol uh, sends the measurements to a receiver gateway. And uh, that uh, receiver through the cloud, through internet connection, uploads the measurements to a web server where we have deployed the uh, Django framework and uh, communicating through MongoDB, we can uh, visualize the uh, measurements and information about the nodes and the sensors on our portal. And there is API also developed for that. So going back to the left on the node, the node apart from the LoRa uh, and LoRa one communication supports BLE and ANT. And of course, it's designed with low power electronics. Uh, we have developed a mesh network with, uh, uh, based on uh, the LoRa uh, protocol. And uh, uh, that is to increase the range uh, for communication when we deploy it at the, at the agriculture fields. Um, we have uh, many years of development experience in this platform and uh, the latest iteration of our node is with IP68 enclosure in order to uh, withstand the, uh, the weather uh, that we have here in Indiana and in other locations. The uh, node is uh, sending uh, communication through LoRa in a receiver which is currently a Raspberry Pi with a LoRa transceiver module on it. Um, of course, the um, advantages of using Raspberry Pi is uh, uh, relatively low cost and easy to deploy and develop. Uh, the operations that take place on the node uh, of the gateway is to decode messages for what format them to for the server and to add some more information that are being sent to the server uh, where we have uh, developed uh, the framework with uh, uh, different databases but uh, for this communication we use mongodb and we have developed all the stacks so we have uh, control on the input and output on the visualization uh, through uh, different uh, pages that I'm, I'm going to show an example on one of the next slides. Hey, before you go to that next slide, I told you I'd be asking some questions. Uh, go back quickly, Harris. Uh, uh, is, a, is a Linux web server a mandatory thing for, for this? Like if a farmer or an agribusiness person wanted this, do, does it need to be Linux? Uh, I am uh, not uh, sure where we can host uh, this uh, Django uh, framework, but I suspect that we can do it in other uh, uh, type of uh, servers. Yeah, um, okay. What uh, we deployed in the uh, field 
uh, the farmer's location would be uh, the Raspberry Pi. So we are hosting the server uh, and uh, the server receives the measurements uh, from the Raspberry Pi through a uh, Wi-Fi internet connection uh, at the uh, uh, farmer's location or uh, collaborator. And uh, the, um, as I said, the databases and the hosting is uh, at uh, Purdue uh, infrastructure. Very good, thanks. You're welcome. So uh, to give more insight on our uh, electronics for the, uh, for the node, uh, this is uh, the third iteration of uh, our uh, node electronics. Uh, we have done uh, some uh, big updates on, on this iteration. Uh, we have many ports for sensors. So we uh, uh, accommodate uh, 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 the nitrate sensors that we develop here at Purdue. Uh, they're low cost. Uh, 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 nitrate sensors on flexible substrates. I'm going to talk about them in next slide uh, through 24-bit uh, ADC. And uh, in this uh, version, we have four inputs for these uh, sensors. And apart from uh, research and development sensors, uh, of course, you don't have to limit to a nitrate measurement concentration, but we develop other sensors as well through the Smart Industry Consortium as well. Uh, apart from these sensors, we uh, have developed an uh, interface with commercial sensors. So we use uh, soil sensors at this point from the meter group. And uh, in addition to that, we have uh, interfaced this board with uh, vibration and pressure sensors. This can be useful also for our manufacturing deployments. And on the board, we have a temperature and humidity sensor to get this environmental uh, measurements and additional ports for uh, more sensors. So this latest uh, packaging is IP68 rated. You can see it on the bottom right. And um, it has a top layer when you open the lid uh, to access the battery compartment that it's uh, above the electronics board. So that is for uh, uh, to facilitate uh, battery changing that, uh, of course, doesn't happen very frequently because uh, everything is a low power and uh, utilizing also the LoRa uh, protocol. Uh, but also this uh, separation has uh, access points to program uh, the, uh, the node and to view uh, troubleshooting LEDs that we have put on the board for uh, potential uh, uh, development work or um, to do on at the field troubleshooting uh, if that occurs. A question in the queue, uh, Harris. Um, they're asking, is this the custom built PCB for your, your specific problem or can this be used in other applications? Yes, uh, great question. So um, uh, this uh, has been designed uh, for uh, uh, compatibility with uh, many different types of sensors. And uh, so we have ADCs for uh, potentiometric sensors or different type of sensors like our nitrate sensor. And uh, we can accommodate uh, commercial sensors with interfaces like SDI-12. Uh, we can develop for that because uh, we also have developed, uh, of course, the firmware for, for this uh, electronics. So apart from that, the, uh, the board has BLE and AND capabilities on that, uh, on top of the LoRa module that we have here. So yes, it can accommodate more sensors and we have also extension ports to connect them with. Uh, so, uh, uh, to uh, um, connect the sensors, uh, right now we have uh, these uh, four ports uh, and uh, connectors for the uh, uh, the nitrate sensors, but you have the extension port, as I said, but we have cable glands that uh, are on the side of the box. And uh, by using this, uh, you can uh, uh, run the wires and uh, keep the uh, uh, the seals. Uh, to maintain this IP68 uh, rating. 
So example of deployments of this version of nodes, you can see on this uh, page. On the left, you can see from uh, uh, July of last year, a deployment in the field. And uh, you can see at the center uh, a picture of a node taken in January uh, of this, uh, uh, sorry, it's January of this year, 2021. So you can see that uh, our nodes uh, 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 go through the uh, uh, some difficult conditions uh, being exposed to the weather elements uh, but they continue working and we were getting measurements from this node and you can see the the location actually where the uh, gateway was uh, situated on the back where you were these silos on the back on the center node and uh, the the right uh, photograph is about uh, a node that we recently uh, deployed in these nodes, you uh, may notice that uh, there is no uh, water uh, uh, close to them. So th these nodes are uh, mostly connected with soil sensors that are inside the ground, run through wires. And what's the source of the power there? Uh, we have the, the batteries. Okay. So with these batteries, uh, uh, these sensors can last months uh, at least a season. And... Um, uh, the batteries uh, are this number in order to accommodate the commercial sensors. Uh, in general, uh, the electronics that we're using and the choice of the LoRa communication protocol is to have very low power um, uh, profile for this uh, whole system. Hey, Alice, question for you. What type of soil sensors are we connecting uh, over here? So here we're connecting the uh, Teros 12 uh, solid sensors from the meter group. Uh, these sensors uh, um, can give the uh, uh, volumetric uh, water concentration and uh, temperature and uh, moisture uh, through the water concentration and conductivity. And uh, we have deployed these sensors. Uh, usually we do two per node and we put them in different depths to see the absorption of uh, the water in different depths. And this will, uh, helps us get insight on uh, the conditions of the soil after operations on the field and absorb uh, uh, how the, uh, the soil absorbs the, the, um, the chemicals, the water, uh, fertilization, uh, applications, etc. But these are not the only sensors that uh, can be connected. We can develop uh, interfaces with other sensors as well. Uh, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, nitrate sensor, the low cost nitrate sensor that uh, we have developed. Uh, it's a potentiometric sensor and uh, uh, the uh, uh, measurements on uh, hundreds of sensors have shown a good sensitivity from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus uh, 1 molar uh, nitrate concentration and in uh, targeted nitrate levels for deployments in the field. Uh, good stability and good uh, reproducibility. So you can see on the right uh, some examples of deployment. So uh, you can see uh, this was the, diff uh, the previous package of our previous version and uh, the uh, nitrate sensor is in the drain tile. Uh, uh, the current packaging of our nitrate sensors with the ion selective electrode and the reference electrode that you can see with a different coating here uh, looks like this. So this is located on a tile and you can also see on the right uh, location uh, on the water stream and on the bottom a uh, general uh, example in a, with graphics of a uh, a deployment of uh, uh, a node with uh, nitrate sensors. So uh, the manufacturing of, of uh, this uh, sensor and fabrication uh, is through roll-to-roll -roll additive manufacturing, uh, inkjet printing and uh, um, screen printing. Uh, the advantage of this uh, type of manufacturing is that it can produce low cost sensors in a vast scale and uh, we do this uh, fabrication uh, we can do this fabrication 
on site. We actually uh, recently acquired the roll to roll uh, screen printing um, uh, tool, but it's been showing here that uh, it can do the screen printing for these sensors. And we add the coating through a uh, microgravure, and we have also inkjet roll to roll printers uh, through our facilities with the smart uh, consortium. And uh, the uh, advantage of this type of fabrication is uh, you can do rapid characterization. And uh, we have developed as well inline characterization, but the ability to print roll to roll um, sensors on flexible substrates, PT substrates that we have, allow us to do technologies transfer from tabletop instruments in the lab to uh, production scale instruments that uh, are actually in the industry. And you can see on the right uh, the example of the working electrodes and the reference electrodes as they are produced by the roll-to-roll -roll instrumentation. So we have added also inline characterization uh, that are on the end of our roll-to-roll -roll line. Uh, characterization with instruments such as uh, confocal capacitive sensors to have the thickness and uh, morphology of our uh, printed uh, uh, sensors and also line scan cameras to get an image and information about the layers of uh, our uh, in the membranes of our, of our sensors. These uh, tools instrumentation uh, allows not only for the optimization of the fabrication parameters but also provides data real-time data uh, that can be used in machine learning and AI uh, algorithms that uh, group, our groups are working on uh, in order to predict uh, the performance and see also how the performance changes while we're tweaking uh, uh, fabrication parameters in our all to roll instrumentation. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the deployments. Uh, as I said, it's a custom Loran BLE boards, and uh, we have nitrate sensors and uh, Teros 12 solid sensors. We previously had equipped our uh, nodes with uh, Decagon sensors from the meter group. So we have approximately uh, 33 nodes uh, deployed uh, uh, in uh, previous years, and we have um, uh, locations that are in uh, the uh, per, uh, Purdue campus and around Purdue, uh, such as Tipac and Acre, and uh, in buildings. Uh, uh, we have deployed, uh, we have a, a network at Ivy Tech. We're, we're working with the Ivy Tech uh, community college. And we have, all, all, of course, deployments at uh, Benton counties and Warren counties, where we are collaborating with farmers there. Uh, with the goal to expand to the rest of the uh, counties of the Wabas uh, Heartland location. So you can see uh, the locations on uh, a map. Uh, you, uh, when you go to the portal, you can see the active nodes with um, a green color, and you can see some uh, red nodes that haven't communicated for um, in the recent day or so. And we have also four locations of Benton County and one at Warren County that you can see average measurements. But uh, there is also uh, access to the, um, to the visualization through password control. So we have also password control on the uh, framework uh, to, to get information about certain deployments. OK, uh, so uh, moving on to the visualization portal, uh, this is the uh, web interface for our framework. And here you can see uh, all the measurements and informations from our um, uh, sensor deployments, and you, you can uh, check uh, the agriculture as well as the manufacturing deployments. I'm going to focus on the agriculture on this uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, link for our portal is on the top, and uh, you can find information there about the project, our collaborators, and uh, uh, the types of the measurements that you can get uh, from our uh, framework. So if you go to a sensor list and then click on the sensor, uh, you're going to navigate to this page. And 
On this page on the top left, you get the uh, metadata information about the node. You get the device ID, a location uh, for the deployment, a number and the type of measurement that uh, this uh, uh, node is for. Uh, you can get the coordinates so when it was last seen, the last recording in the database of the measurement, the remaining battery and the types of sensors and uh, when they started being active for that node. You can also see on the bottom left uh, the location of the node in a, um, a small thumbnail of uh, Google Maps. Uh, the moment you uh, load the page, you will see the last uh, few measurements from that device. Uh, it's going to be the temperature and the humidity uh, measurements by default. But if you go to the graph data panel, you can uh, select the different variables that correspond to the sensors that are uh, enabled on this node. And you can select the uh, um, different dates that you can plot for. So you can uh, plot for uh, uh, whatever dates you want to look at. And uh, the uh, plot also allows you to hover and to look at the measurements and uh, uh, zoom in and out and um, uh, play with the graph uh, since it's based on the Plotly Python module. You also have the capability of exporting uh, the raw data from the node uh, by selecting the dates and uh, uh, pressing the button to export as uh, CSV. Uh, this will get all the data from the node, uh, including uh, the, uh, the connections uh, for uh, sensors that might not be actually hooked up on the node. So um, you need to refer back to the unit information on this uh, page to make sure that you're looking actually at um, the uh, sensor measurements that you're looking for and you're not getting uh, dummy measurements. You also see in the center of the screen, uh, we have added a panel where it uh, gives you information about changing on the sensor or the node. Uh, for example, in this case, we had a scheduled network inter interruption on that date, and it actually shows up as a marker on, on the uh, plot. This uh, gives information to the user about uh, uh, um, uh, disco discontinuities that uh, you might see uh, or interruptions on the plot and gives you insight on any work that is happening on the particular node. So uh, we have added some features uh, to uh, facilitate um, uh, addition on our portal. So we, uh, with simple scripts, we can add and modify nodes. So by uh, uh, running a, uh, that script and uh, uh, putting the basic information, you can add a node uh, in the central list table, and you can actually define the location where it's going to be located in this table. And uh, uh, by putting the inputs on that function that you call on the script, you can actually enable the uh, uh, sensor types and numbers and uh, also add the deployment date and uh, any sensor changes that uh, take place for that deployment. So this allows you not only to add a node uh, with uh, a few simple fast uh, steps, but it also allows you to change um, sensor information on already deployed nodes. So our framework is easy to use and uh, easy to expand on uh, new types of uh, deployments. Uh, another, uh, uh, another framework uh, feature is uh, the addition of an actual new sensor or sensing element, if you may. So uh, right now we have uh, two uh, uh, basic uh, external sensors on the node, which is the nitrate uh, uh, sensor and the soil sensor. But if you want to add another uh, sensor, you can uh, use uh, uh, the simple script and uh, this will generate new bindings in the databases and uh, new node pages in the portal. So you see an example of 
in addition of a custom sensor that is not the nitrate or the soil sensor. This will also populate uh, the new tag fields so you can uh, plot them easily. So as I said, this, this allows for integration of new sensors in the same framework. So um, let me talk a little bit about future work. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, we, the type of the uh, sensor uh, architecture for our network relies on the existence of a bridge that you can see on the left. So for agriculture deployments, we have uh, our communication protocol is based on LoRa and we have enabled LoRa mesh. So distant nodes can use uh, closer to the bridge or gateway nodes to relay uh, the messages to that. And also uh, based on uh, LoRa communication, like a star network, we, you can send the measurements to the bridge. And then that uh, bridge is connected to our uh, um, framework and to our databases. Also, uh, you can connect Bluetooth sensors to, to the same uh, bridge. Now we're moving to an integration of uh, LoRa uh, mesh and Bluetooth, and LoRa 1 to LoRa 1. So uh, we uh, will add uh, capabilities on our uh, gateway or bridge that collects the measurements from the different uh, sensor networks uh, to be able to uh, connect to LoRa 1 uh, network and application servers so you can take advantage of uh, the security and the different types of integrations uh, that uh, this uh, um, implementation offers. Also, at the same time, you will be able to connect directly to our databases and use our existing framework. Uh, so this summarizes our current and uh, future efforts. And uh, this concludes uh, uh, my part of the presentation. Um, are there any questions at this point before hanging out? Well, there have been a number of questions in the queue, but uh, let me let me ask one here um, related. And I think you've already answered this, uh, Harris. But um, you know the, the the concept of interacting with um, not only other sensors but databases and like mm -hmm. uh, computing solutions in the cloud and that and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, could, could you enlighten us a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, right now, uh, the basic type of database that we're using for our framework is MongoDB. Uh, but, uh, and this takes place internally in our framework. Uh, we have the capability of integrating different types of uh, databases and also forwarding our measurements uh, to uh, different types of databases. And uh, that makes it easy, uh, the integration with existing frameworks and cloud solutions. So you can replicate, if you want, uh, that uh, pathway to or um, the framework to, to also forward it to another type of database. And uh, also, uh, yes, uh, we have the capability of adding new types of sensors because uh, apart from the total control of the framework stacks, that we have also control uh, since we developed and maintain the uh, the firmware and uh, um, ports and expansions on our uh, readout node, uh, the one that uh, uh, we connect our sensing elements to. So we have additional ports, and it's a matter of uh, developing uh, um, the the firmware part uh, to add uh, existing uh, either commercial or research sensors. Well, really, thanks for your uh, time and your work, um, Harris, on um, all this work on trying to, uh, you know, getting the sensors to talk to each other for to get that information back in from the field. That's really an important part of making this whole digital agricultural thing work. And it's been, frankly, a bottleneck in, in you know, to make everything, um, you know, get the solutions for the farmers and the retailers and everyone. So again, thanks. Um, at this point in time, um, we're, we're going to uh, 
switch a little bit uh, over to um, a, another person that's working in a similar area in the, in um, the same shop, basically. And uh, it's Nathan Raganathan. And um, what he is going to do is to focus more on the manufacturer side of things, but a number of things that he'll talk about will also relate back to what we're doing in agriculture. And so, uh, Nathan, uh, take it away, please. Cool. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, thanks, Harris, for the nice presentation. So, what uh, what uh, I generally wanted to focus on is on the other side of our deployments, which has mostly been on the manufacturing side, which, as Bruce mentioned, has a lot of applications on the ag, ag side, too. So... One of the main things that we focused on is on condition-based mon condition monitoring for manufacturing deployments. And the reason, so one of the questions that most people can ask is, you know, why do we need this, okay? And the reason is, okay, with, with most manufacturing industries, they wanna have a, like 100% uptime in almost all of the plant operations that, in other words, they don't wanna ever shut down the manufacturing line. The way they do that is that, but you know, with most things in life, things break, like all of your machinery. So there are multiple ways you can handle it. One is the preventive maintenance where you go through periodic cycles and actually fix stuff. Or you have your reactive maintenance where like once the machine breaks, you're like scrambling to get it up and running by replacing it or fixing it in the process. What you really want to stand about is actually stand in the middle where you know you want to do condition monitoring where you can actually do both preventive as well as reactive maintenance before anything can actually happen. So by that, you can reduce the number of failures that happen and achieve like near 100% uptime in operations. Now, the two most common ways of condition monitoring in manufacturing is tends to be one is temperature, where if the machine starts getting hot, you know something is actually happening. The other one is vibration. This is similar to your car. You know, if you start hearing the little rumbling in your engine motor, you start to wonder, okay, maybe something's wrong and you need to take it into the shop. The same concept actually applies over here. How does that actually work though? Okay, so for that, we need sensors. Like, you know, one of the sensors that most people use is a PCB sensors, which is a piezoelectric sensor, it tends to be the gold standard. Other low cost sensors tend to be the fluke vibration sensor, which is more on the reactive maintenance side because all it can tell you is something's wrong and it usually when it's closer to things that need to be fixed. Now, what we wanna do in this circumstance is that see whether we can replace the PCB sensor, which is about $1,000 a piece to something that is cheaper, something like the piezoelectric or the MEM sensor. And in some cases, the flexible vibration sensor that we are currently developing. And the next step is take all of these sensors connected to manufacturing equipment, use our customized PCBs, customized uh, interface hardware and upload the data to the cloud so that we can bring it back. This is similar to what Harris has already presented to you in the ag side. You know, we want sensors to be able to send the data back to a remote location where we can actually pick it or download it and do our analysis. So for that reason, we had to create like a man of, so uh, to create some test beds on that. This kind of gives you an overview of our manufacturing deployments. We started with a lab scale test bed, which is usually a 12 volt DC motor, moved to a large scale test bed, which is like a control environments like the Burke Nanotechnology Center. And then we go to the manufacturing plants to actually deploy these sensors out to get some real world data. And in all cases, we want to look at close to the end of life, store the data, do some signal processing, some uh, artificial intelligence analytics, which I'm going to get to and do dashboards, pretty much use the framework that Harris has already worked on to actually visually display the data in a, in a sense that makes, um, in a methodology that kind of makes sense to us. We have done these deployments at various places with some of the uh, places at Purdue being the Perk Nanotechnology Center, the Indiana, and also the Indiana Manufacturing Institute. And we've transferred these deployments also to other places like Biotone Ag, Evonik, Tate and & Lyle, and Drug Plastics, all industries in the 10 county region around Lafayette. The, before, uh, one of the things that I briefly touched upon is the flexible vibration sensor. Like the flexible nitrate sensors, we've also been trying to reduce the cost of the sensors. And for that, 
uh, one of the groups at Purdue has actually come up with this novel method of making flare, piezoelectric composites on flexible substrates using the same roll-to-roll -roll process. Um, this is the grad is near the grad students that are working on the group. His name is Armin, and the professor that's working on this research project is Miko Chakman. With this, you can create low-cost sensors in the order of few cents a piece. As the scheme, almost the same capability as the uh, has the, almost the same capability as your PCB sensor. And in fact, what we did is we did comparisons of the PCB sensors with the flexible sensors and also low cost MEM sensors, deployed them out on bulk motors to see how the data is compares, how the data compares, and whether we can actually analyze fa failure from the same data. Turns out we can come pretty close. Now, now there are some fine tune uh, fine tuning that needs to be uh, that needs to happen which is basically in the design of the sensor and such because you know when we designed the sensor they initially designed it with the intent of making monitoring low vibrations and also to make it as a flexible speaker now we want to fine tune it to behave more on the pcb sensor so we want to find we want to be able to pick up uh, spectrums in the higher order of, uh, frequency ranges like in the four kilohertz to the five kilohertz range whereas if you notice in the flexible vibration sensor right now we are limited to about the two kilohertz range now this is something that we can work on but in terms of consistency of the data we are pretty well consistent this kind of shows the waterfall plot of a repeated sensor measurements over several hundred hours other thing, other novel technologies that we've been working on is like sound-based condition monitoring. A uh, best way that I normally explain this to most people is like going back to the old engine, engine analogy that I brought up at the beginning of the presentation. It's like, okay, when you hear your car making like a weird noise in your motor, you immediately assume that something is wrong. Now the same concept can actually be applied to your machinery. You know, when you start hearing that little rumbling, hey, you know that something failure is going to happen. Now, what if we take out the human element in that prospect and actually make this all computerized? So what guys, uh, what uh, researchers uh, such as Martin Jun and Yon Sub Kim has developed is a stethoscope based sensor that's connected to a Raspberry Pi. And then the Raspberry Pi just monitors the sound frequencies. And then from the sound frequencies, we can uh, get the FFT and the frequency analysis and then do a cloud serve. So they tried this configuration with three different vacuum pumps, the same vacuum pumps that we've deployed our other sensors on. And turns out that, you know, we can actually see the difference between a new and an old pump in the frequency shift. Like for example, in a new pump, we've seen the peer fundamental peak at around 400 Hertz, but with an old pump, we started seeing the shift go towards 117 Hertz. And with a pump that's actually starting to break, we all of a sudden see a saw sharp uh, spike at around 300 Hertz. Now, taking all of this data, if you actually turn and put in some artificial intelligence and search, you can actually remove that entire human aspect and be able to identify, you know, failure before it happens and get an idea for some preventive maintenance in that circumstance. So some of the next steps that you want to do is like, you know, basically training. So you want to, you take the normal data, we want to get a lot of normal data and we also want to compare it with anomalous data and get an auto, uh, get a train model to reconstruct normal status. The last, as the one of the other aspects of this project is visualization. You know, you collect all of this data, it sits in a database somewhere, but you also want to be able to visualize it in real time so that if somebody else like you, me, or any of the engineers in the plant want to take a look at it, they want to be able to visualize it in, a, in an easy fashion. Harris actually did a lot of work on this visualization aspect. In fact, this is, I'm just speaking for Harris on this one. And some of the work that he's done is on the Grafana based plotting, which is you can connect multiple different sensors in the same environment. Over here, we see the Burke environmental sensors, all the vibration sensors and the temperature and humidity sensors that have been connected to the uh, Burke pumps. Over here, and then we have also custom plotting, uh, custom plotting that is similar to the uh, uh, visualization that Harris presented on the agriculture side, where we can see the vibration of the XYZ of uh, some LoRaWAN and uh, LoRaWAN based and Bluetooth based uh, sensors that we've been using. Expanding the Grafana interface well, further, you can also kind of you can also communicate you can also connect uh, sensors of different types to it. So 
this basically is that we've actually uh, connected three different types of sensors. One is a wired-based thermocouples, wireless-based LoRaWAN-based sensors, and wireless BLE vibration sensors and a three-phase current meter, all connected to the three vacuum pumps in the subfab of the Burke Nanotechnology Center. This shows you like a direct uh, visualization using Grafana of all of the data that you see. From this, this also helps us analyze how each of these factors relate to each other and what could actually be causing failures and what what can be used to identify failures early on in the in the in the process. The last thing that I want to touch base on is AI techniques and IO systems. This is something that I feel like can can be added to both agriculture and manufacturing. The first one is the reduced data transfer. Why do we need to worry about data transfer and wireless technology? Well, from this little table right here, what happens is in all of these sensors, the majority of the power consumption is actually in the transmission phase. What if we can reduce the amount of data we transfer, but at the same time retain the information that we need to do? That's what the reduce, what the anomaly detection and reduced data transfer is trying to achieve. And basically, using algorithms that are developed by researchers, sorry, uh, by and Professor Bakshi's group and other groups, is that you can actually, you know, effectively predict what your next data is going to be sent. We've tried this out for a couple of sensors for using LoRa technologies, and we can uh, we can reduce the uh, we can instead of transmitting 100% of the data, we transmit only 30% of the data, but and then compare it with what the real data that is being recorded. And it turns out you can actually get a pretty close agreement to what we want to see, especially with temperature related data. Now, let's try something where, and we tried the same process with something where, which has a higher data transmission range, like uh, vibration data. Whereas in vibration data, we are not looking at single point measurements and we need to transfer data more frequently, especially when you want to get the frequency based analysis from it did the same thing. In this case, we had a higher percentage of data sent, which is about 55%, but still the agreement to the actual data being recorded was pretty high. So we can actually reduce, we can effectively reduce the amount of time, uh, amount of data that we transmit. By that, we save a lot of the battery power, which means that now we can have sensors also out on the field much longer with less interference from humans. Another one that we've also explored is deep learning model for condition monitoring data. What this essentially means is that, hey, you know, if you look at the manufacturing spectrum, you have motors and machine pumps and everything of different vibration frequencies and sizes. What if you develop models on a one pump and see whether we can do like a transfer learning to the other pumps? That's what this effectively covers. And so basically what they did is that they did like uh, pumps at different uh, RPMs develop models based on long or uh, it's a LSTM, which is a convol uh, sorry, convolution neural uh, networks and long sh short term modeling. I took both of those, uh, both of those, uh, both of those algorithms and see a, see a, a develop an AI algorithm for that and then transferred it to the higher frequency models. The next step that they want to do is apply this, uh, this type of transfer learning process to wireless technologies and actually test it along actual manufacturing deployments. The last, sorry, the last, I actually kind of forgot about this, but the last one we have is also the useful life prediction. Okay, there's all this times where we've been talking about all the data that we've actually been collecting. What if we can actually use AI models to also predict what you think is approximately the AI uh, remaining useful life in your pro in your machinery? So that's what this entire method, uh, this entire process uh, entails. Basically, what you do is that you take your data, you extract the features, and you then start seeing how the feature changes as you actually progress towards the time. And from that, you can actually uh, get an idea of your your useful life uh, prediction. So this kind of gives you like, you know, kind of an idea of when your mission, when your machinery is about to fail. So for example, if you had collected data up to about 600 hours, you expect the machinery to be failing about a thousand hours or so based on some of the real time data that we obtain. Now we've been yet to validate it because you're talking about thousand hours, which could take a while before the machine actually fails. So 
but this is uh, something that's still in the works on this in this project so anyway i really want i didn't want to spend too much time actually you know on all of the manufacturing deployments mostly because you know uh, the key goal of this was digital ag but i just wanted to give you kind of like um a flavor of all the different type of manufacturing deployments we've been doing. In addition, I also wanted to give you kind of like a summary of all the things that we have covered in this entire presentation. Some of the stuff that Harris has covered, which is the agriculture deployments, the new technologies like the flexible nitrate sensors, the electronics, the network infrastructure, and the visualization. Um, and for the manufacturing development is most on the vibration technologies the low cost uh, vibration sensors, the sound based condition monitoring and the visualization. And last but not the least is the AI techniques for all of this, which is the edge analytics, the RPM invariant model and the remaining useful life prediction. Now, some of the challenges that we do experience is connectivity. This is why we try some of these long range, short range data. Our environment, you know, ag environments can get like, you know, pretty hard to deploy sensors. And industrial environments, depending on the industry you work in, it can be anywhere from toxic industries like, you know, lead-based, lead battery manufacturing to, you know, corn processing and such. Or, you know, easy, nice for clean environments like pharma and pharma-based deployments. So pharmaceutical based deployments. So we have to have sensors that actually work in all of these different environments with reliable data. And the last thing is training data, you know, to get all of these models, to develop all of these models, we need a bunch of training data, which is historic data of showing what is good versus bad, so that we can actually develop algorithms that actually be able to predict what is actually happening in the system. So our future step involves a lot of testing, a lot of uh, a lot of ag, sen ag industrial sensor integrations, basically an ag machinery and such, edge analytics, and and we are constantly improving a dashboard based on feedback that we get from our customers. With that being said, um, that's I that's the end of my side of the presentation. So I was hoping if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Well, <clears throat> I certainly have a question or two, uh, Nathan, and thanks very much for uh, your comments and um, um, all the work that you're doing in this area. And um, so, I mean, many. I've heard some people describe that a farm is basically a factory without a roof on it. And so a lot of things that you're doing in manufacturing, you know, certainly are going to apply. But um, the um, I guess one of the things I might ask you is that, um, you know, what do you what do you think are the a, a couple of the most promising applications in agriculture? Like if some of the stuff that you're working on, you know, pull out some of what you've talked about and what, what might be something that would be useful, you know, in the near future? So one of the things that I really think uh, which would be really useful is our condition monitoring in agriculture. So especially with farming equipment and stuff like your tractors, your motors and all of that other things, it would be useful to achieve the same thing, you know, be able to monitor this equipment before they actually fail. Because the last thing you want is something to fail while you're in the middle of planting or in the middle of tilling or anything else that happens. You know, you don't want to be in the part where, okay, sure, this has failed. I need to do some reactive maintenance. What if you could actually figure out this is coming close to failure? When you have a rainy day, you take your actual agriculture equipment, go in, fix it before you can go in for the next time or you go outside for planting. So that's one way to look at it. That would be the easiest one that I can think of. The other one that I could think of is probably, you know, a data transmission. How do we connect all of these farming sensors? and not have to replace batteries f frequently. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure that those types of sensors exist on, you know, some of the existing, you know, tractors and implements and that kind of stuff, but maybe not as much in a shop or, you know, in a grain handling facility mm -hmm. and, and some of those other types of things. And I, I think I'm probably right on that, but um, anyway, um, just in uh, the remaining useful life, I hope, um, you know, for an old guy like me, I hope you don't start hooking sensors onto me and then start calculating how much use <laughs> I have left, you know, so uh, oh, come on, that Bruce. probably would not be good. I, oh, I think I, I, I expect to see you live for 200 years. Oh, well, I think your <laughs> estimate's a little high there, perhaps, you know, so, um, so anyway, um, 
I think that's probably good for now. I uh, really appreciate uh, the time, you know, and expertise of uh, Nathan and uh, Harry. And um, we, we, need, uh, we need people like you outside of agriculture to help us uh, that have worked primarily in agriculture all of our lives. And I, you know, I shouldn't say you're outside of agriculture. You're, you're certainly, um, you know, part of our team here. Um, so anyway, with that, um, you know, and thanks to our participants today and to those that are listening to the recording. And um, we will be back uh, again um, next fall with another series of uh, webinars. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for the opportunity.